in order to understand the answer to that, it helps to take a couple of steps back and look at chapter 13 um, to set the stage. So in the chapter 13, which is not available to businesses, it's only available to individuals and legally married couples, the debtor files uh, bankruptcy, same sort of schedules as in, say, a chapter 7 or a chapter 11. And as part of the filing, the debtor includes a plan. Now, it's not as elaborate a plan as, say, in a chapter 11 reorganization, but it is a plan that has, at least on certain levels, uh, similarities there. And the idea is the debtor is going to make payments through the plan to the creditors and then at the completion of the plan, any debts that weren't paid in full will be just wiped out, with the exception of student loans. If you still owe on student loans after the completion of the plan, you'll still owe. That uh, unpaid portion will not be discharged. Now, one of the benefits to Chapter 13 is there are some debts that are dischargeable in a Chapter 13, but are not dischargeable in a Chapter 7 or a Chapter 11. So I'm thinking, obviously, of individuals and married couples because businesses can't do a Chapter 13. Among those uh, debts that you can discharge in a Chapter 13, but you can't in a 7 or an 11, are uh, debts that are owed to a spouse or a former spouse that were incurred as part of a separation agreement or a divorce decree that are not domestic support. So they're not child support or alimony. Those you can discharge in the sense that through the plan you might pay them at less than 100%. And then at the completion of the plan, the unpaid portion is just wiped out. Another that is dischargeable in a Chapter 13, but not in a Chapter 7, is a debt that's the result of doing willful and malicious harm to property. Now, in Chapter 7, you can't get rid of a debt that's the result of doing willful and malicious harm either to a person or to property. In Chapter 13, the property exclusion is not there. So you could have done willful and malicious harm to property and pay a portion of that debt through the plan and then at the completion of the plan the unpaid portion is discharged. So there is something attractive about that. In fact, ch chapter 13 has always had what's called the super discharge of chapter 13 and at one point it even included debts incurred through fraud but that's been done away with. Now there are two basic types of chapter 13 discharges. One discharge is under Section 1328A, and that has the shorter list of non-dischargeable debts that I've been uh, discussing. There are a few others that I haven't mentioned, but I'm more looking at the principles here right now. Now, sometimes a Chapter 13 debtor who's been in the plan for a while finds that it's impossible to continue because of circumstances that are beyond the control of that debtor. So that debtor can get a hardship discharge under Section 1328B uh, under certain circumstances. The debtor has to already have satisfied what's called the Chapter 7 liquidation requirement for Chapter 13, meaning that uh, the debtor has already repaid the unsecured creditors at least as much as they would have gotten in a Chapter 7 liquidation, that the reason that the debtor can't continue in the plan is not the debtor's fault, the debtor couldn't be held justly uh, accountable for this inability to continue, and modifying the plan is not practicable. So in that situation, the debtor can get a hardship discharge, but in the hardship discharge scenario, the list of non-dischargeable debts is the same as in Chapter 7. So yes, you get a Chapter 13 discharge, but you don't get that super discharge under Chapter 13 with a hardship discharge. Okay, so that sets the stage for a provision that was added in the Consolidated Appropriations Act uh, on the discharge in Section 1328. And what it provides is, in essence, a hardship discharge, but a hardship discharge under Section 1328A meaning all those debts that are dischargeable in a normal, completed, 
chapter 13 plan are dischargeable in this super hardship discharge. On top of that, the requirements seem to be a lot lighter than under the normal hardship discharge. So there has to be notice in a hearing and uh, the debtor requests that um, the judge grant this hardship discharge under the Consolidated Appropriations Act and it's going to be a discharge under section 1328A and that is to a debtor who has not completed all the payments under the plan to the trustee or to a creditor uh, holding a security interest in the debtor's principal residence. So uh, there may have been an arrearage in the plan, the debtor hasn't completed the arrearage, the debtor can still get this hardship discharge under section 1328A if two scenarios. One, the debtor has not defaulted on more than three monthly payments due on the residential mortgage on or after March 13th, 2020. That um, problem of missing the payments has to be due directly or indirectly to financial hardship that uh, arose because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So that's the first situation. It's not a very big hurdle. All the debtor has to have done is not defaulted at all or defaulted on fewer than three monthly payments since March 13th, 2020, and these are payments due on the residential mortgage. Um, or the second uh, has two parts. The first part is the plan provides for the curing of a default uh, on the mortgage. So what does that mean? Um, prior to filing the bankruptcy, the debtor had a mortgage arrearage and it's using the chapter 13 plan to cure that arrearage by paying it off over time. So that's the first thing that the plan had this provision. Doesn't mean the debtors completed this requirement, just that the plan had that provision. And the second part is the debtor has entered into a forbearance agreement or a loan modification agreement with that particular holder or servicer. That is the one in which there's the arrearage. Now, it doesn't really say that the debtor has to have entered into that forbearance agreement or loan modification agreement during the pendency of the Chapter 13 plan. So the debtor, prior to filing the bankruptcy, might have had one of these forbearance agreements or loan modification agreement, went into the plan, had an arrearage at the time, put the arrearage into the plan, and now uh, missed fewer than, well, you don't even have to have missed the uh, uh, fewer than three payments in this second requirement. You're just in the plan and you decide, well, I've had my fill, I'd like to get a discharge. And you can get a discharge under section 1328A, which has the shorter list of non-dischargeable debts. So this is a big deal as far as I'm concerned based on my chapter 13 practice. Uh, now, this is only going to be in effect until December 27th, 2021. There are things in the Consolidated Appropriations Act that sunset one year after the act went into effect. There are a few things that go into, uh, that sunset two years after the act went into effect. This is one of those one year. So for somebody that's uh, doing a chapter 13, this is a big deal. And what's also interesting about this is it doesn't say that the debtor has to have already filed the Chapter 13 at the time that this act went into effect. So a debtor could conceivably file a Chapter 13 right now, stay in the plan for a little bit, satisfy one of these two scenarios, and get a hardship discharge under Section 1328A uh, after a short time in the plan. Now, the one caveat here is this uh, is only granted after notice in a hearing, meaning that the judge has a certain amount of discretion to grant this type of a thing. So you better have a, a good fact pattern before you go into the courtroom and ask the judge to grant you a 1328A discharge, because the 1328A discharge means that you have a shorter time window between that particular case and if you need to file another bankruptcy case, the filing of that subsequent case.